Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Across the River and Into the Trees by Ernest Hemingway. So, uh, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say, currently at the time of filming, I'm, paid, I'm on page 92 of 220, so about halfway through, I'm just going to give you my first set of tabs today, and then catch up with you again tomorrow. So, Dane reads... Across the river and into the trees is Hemingway's powerful, poignant story of the inability to capture lost youth. The war is over. In Venice, a city elaborately and affectionately described, the American colonel, Richard Cantrell, falls passionately in love with Renata, a young Italian countess who has a profile that could break your or anyone else's heart. Cantrell is embittered, war-scarred, and old enough to be Renata's father, but he is overwhelmed by the selflessness and freshness of the love she is offering. But this is no fairy tale. The fighting may be ended, but the wounds of war have not yet healed, and for some, the longed-for peace has come too late. So I don't really like love slash romance stories, but as you can tell from that, it's not just a straightforward love and romance story. Um, also, it made me think of Charlie, Charles Heathcote quite a lot because uh, we were chatting about Venice recently on one of his videos because I sent him a guidebook to Venice when I sent him some other books because I know he's learning Italian and I wanted to give him some inspiration, you know? So, um, and yeah, there's quite a lot of Italian in this as well, so it might be one for him to pick up because there were times when I was reading this and I was tempted to message him being like, what does this mean? What does that mean? So we have a note before we get started. In view of a recent tendency to identify characters in fiction with real people, it seems proper to state that there are no real people in this volume. Both the characters and their names are fictitious. The names or designations of any military units are fictitious. There are no living people nor existing military units presented in this book. I mean, not quite true, because he goes on about like Rommel and Montgomery, who were famous generals during the Second World War. But you know. The major characters, anyway. And um, he's talking about here, uh, the local museum. And I just think this could be a description of any local museum. All they got in the local museum is arrowheads, war bonnets, scalping knives, different scalps, petrified fish, pipes of peace, photographs of liver-eating Johnston, and the skin of some bad man that they hanged him and some doctor skinned him out. And we get this, which I just thought was a nice little um, touch of character, I guess, from uh, characterization about the colonel. The river was slow and a muddy blue here, with reeds along the edges, and the colonel, no one being in sight, squatted low, and looking across the river from the bank where you could never show your head in daylight, relieved himself in the exact place where he had determined, by triangulation, that he had been badly wounded 30 years before. Kind of showing his contempt for uh, the war that wounded them there, you know? And uh, he's talking about the French here. <laughs> he says, uh, there you fight your way into a city that you love and are very careful about breaking anything and then, if you have good sense, you are careful not to go back because you will meet some military characters who will resent your having fought your way in. Vive la France et les pommes de terre frites, liberté, venalité, stupidité. Um, and that's just, like, well it means long live France and potato fries. Uh, liberty, venality and stupidity and it's just a play on the French national motto which is liberté, égalité, fraternité. Which people are also arguing about at the moment because obviously fraternity and it, it, you know, could be sorority. And then he talks about someone from Milan and I went to Milan for a conference and I, I didn't, the conference was good but the city itself. Well, I described it in one of my poems as it has the Dutch debauchery in Birmingham's buildings. It was just like very run down, graffiti and scaffolding everywhere. Um, the people weren't particularly nice. It just wasn't a very nice place. It, it gave me bad vibes. But um, yeah, he says here, in the bar, sitting at the first table as he came in, there was a post-war rich from Milan, fat and hard as only Milanese can be, sitting with his expensive looking and extremely desirable mistress. They were drinking Negronis, a combination of two sweet vermouths and seltzer water, and the colonel wondered how much taxes the man had escaped to buy that sleek girl in a long mint coat and the convertible he had seen the chauffeur take up the long winding ramp to lock away. The pair stared at him with the bad manners of their kind, and he saluted lightly and said to them in Italian, I am sorry that I am in uniform, but it is a uniform, not a costume. So, uh, yeah, obviously Hemingway has been to Milan. We get the line, happiness, as you know, is a movable feast, which is uh, the title of one of Hemingway's novels, uh, and that's actually from Paris. If you, are lucky to have li if you are lucky enough to have lived as a young man in Paris, it will stay with you for the rest of your life, for Paris is a movable feast. We get this line, Spanish is a rough language, the colonel thought, rougher than a corn cob sometimes, but you can say what you mean in it and make it stick. Now I wouldn't know I don't speak any Spanish, although it has always struck me as a not particularly beautiful language. I mean, I speak English, so you know, <laughs> possibly one of the ugliest languages. English and German, a bit of German, I speak a bit of German, both pretty ugly languages. Um, and then French, obviously, quite a beautiful language. 
in my opinion. Just a little bit of philosophy here from the Colonel. He says, um, I've loved but three women and have lost them thrice. You lose them the same way you lose a battalion, by errors of judgment, orders that are impossible to fulfill, and through impossible conditions, also through brutality. I have lost three battalions in my life and three women, and now I have a fourth and loveliest, and where the hell does it end? They talk about going by stairs or elevator, and um, his love interest says, by elevator, you can call a boy or we can run it ourselves, which just shows you how old this book was. And one of my interesting facts is that Basically, automated elevators were around way before people think they were around. It's just nobody trusted them. Um, it's a bit like self-driving cars where people actually don't want to get into a self-driving car because they don't trust it, but even though the technology is there. And actually, um, automated elevators were only really phased out during the Second World War because so many of the men who worked the elevators had gone off to fight. Here uh, we get this at the start of chapter 12. They, they were at their table in the far corner of the bar where the colonel had both his flanks covered and he rested solidly against the corner of the room. The Grand Maestro knew about this since he'd been an excellent sergeant in a good company of infantry in a first-rate regiment and he would no more have seated his colonel in the middle of a room than he would have taken up a stupid defensive position. And that's interesting to me because that's essentially what's known as the police policeman's seat. It's actually where I tend to sit in restaurants as well. It just means you've got your back stood like preferably two or th even three walls if you can uh, and you can see everything that's going on. No one can sneak up behind you. We get this little bit as well. I understand the colonel said but please daughter you try to understand my attitude too. When we have killed so many we can afford to be kind. How many have you killed? 122 shores not counting possibles. You had no remorse? Never. Nor bad dreams about it. Nor bad dreams but usually strange ones. Combat dreams always for a while after combat, but then strange dreams about places mostly. We live by accidents of terrain, you know, and terrain is what remains in the dreaming part of your mind. And also that just shows uh, one of the things he calls her daughter, even though he's, he's shagging her. And at one point she even says like, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could be your daughter? And he'd be like, yeah, but then we'd be committing incest. And she's like, well, this city's seen worse. So we get this great exchange as well. Uh, you ought to write, the girl said. I mean it truly. So someone would know about such things. No, the colonel disagreed. I have not the talent for it, and I know too much. Almost any liar writes more convincingly than a man who was there. Uh, just a great line here. The young sleep late, he thought, and the beautiful sleep half again as late. Well, I must be young and beautiful then. Even though I did get a comment on YouTube the other day where someone just said, you look really ill. Thank you. That was nice. That was very nice of you. And just a couple of great little paragraphs here I wanted to read out. There's no more privacy in the army than in a professional shithouse. I've never been in a professional shithouse, but I imagine they run it much the same. I could learn to run one, he thought. Then I'd make all my leading shells characters ambassadors, and the unsuccessful ones could be corps commanders or command military districts in peacetime. Don't be bitter, boy, he said to himself. It's too early in the morning and your duty is not completed yet. What would you do with our wives, he asked himself. Buy them new hats or shoot them, he said. It's all part of the same process. And uh, this is just some interesting sort of stuff on the value of a, a human life. What's a man's life worth anyway? $10,000 if his insurance is paid up in our army. What the hell has that got to do with it? Oh yes, that was what I was thinking about before those jerks showed up. How much money I had saved my government in my time when people like Benny Myers are in the trough. Yes, he said. And how much you lost them at the chateau that time at 10 G's ahead. Well, nobody ever really understood it except me, I guess. There's no reason to tell them now. Your commanding general sometimes puts things down as the fortunes of war. Back at army, they know such things are bound to happen. You do it as ordered with a big butcher bill and you're a hero. And we get this, he's talking about his ex-wife. Um, She's too conceited ever to be sad and she married me to advance herself in army circles and have better contacts for what she considered her profession or her art. She was a journalist. But they are dreadful, the girl said. I agree. And what's interesting is Hemingway started his career as a journalist. He was a cub reporter. I can't remember the name of the newspaper though. Another great line. They say you should never speak ill of the dead, but I think it is the best time to speak truly of them. I've never said anything of a dead that I would not say to his face. And he added, in spades. I mean, you get the line. We had more wire strung than there are cunts in tech. Please keep telling me and be as little rough as you can. I don't know what that word means and I don't want to know. Texas is a big state, the colonel said. That is why I used it and its female population as a symbol. You cannot say more cunts than Wyoming because there are less than 30,000 there. Perhaps hell make it 50. And there was a lot of wire and he kept stringing it and rolling it up and stringing it again. So here we have this great little bit where he's talking about how you should use a pistol as a blunt weapon. So he says, if you ever hit Andre, hit him with a barrel, not with a butt. The butt is awfully slow and it misses and if it lands you get blood on your hands when you put the gun away. 
Also, please do not ever hit Andrea because he is my friend. I do not think it would be easy to hit either. And she's like, yeah, you're probably right. And uh, the Colonel gets this great bit of wisdom here. Obviously, he's still creepily calling her a daughter, but that's just their thing. He says, I proceed to reveal. Listen carefully, daughter. This is the supreme secret. Listen, love is love and fun is fun. But it is always so quiet when the goldfish die. And we get another reference. He says, next Saturday is a movable feast, daughter. And uh, just this little bit on liars was interesting as well. He says, uh, a liar in full flower, the colonel had thought, is as beautiful as cherry trees or apple trees when they're in blossom. Who should ever discourage a liar, he thought, unless he is giving you coordinates. It's a very army thing to think, isn't it? It's actually quite a minor thing, but um, just for the sake of completeness, there's this great line here. Um, I better just give her my love, but how the hell do you send it? And how do you keep it fresh? They can't pack it in dry eye. So yeah, Across the River and Into the Trees by Ernest Hemingway, very beautifully written. Um, some of the bits about the war were fascinating, others not so much. And I'm not really one for like love and romance in stories, but I think it worked well here because it was a bit of a bit of a bleak one, you know? Um, it wasn't all sunshine and lollipops. But um, yeah, I would give it a pretty solid four out of five. Did enjoy, would recommend, especially to Hemingway fans, if you're interested in Venice, if you're interested in the war, um, or if you've just enjoyed the quotes that I read out, you're probably gonna enjoy it. So there we have it, that's what I made of Across the River and Into the Trees by Ernest Hemingway. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.